Hi there, I'm Dave from Dave's Custom Airsoft and welcome to DCA FMV. In this first video, we're going to install the Tier 3 Plus MOSFET into the Tokyo Maruri Delta Custom Recall Shop. The idea of this video is to show you exactly how we install the parts from this package and to give you some helpful hints and tips along the way. All of these parts are available to purchase at www.davescustomairsoft.co.uk and if you want to send your rifle into us to have us install it for you, simply contact us uh, by email, social media or give us a call. So the list of internal parts are as follows, from back to front we've got our uh, drilled out CTR stock allows you to use Nupro 1100 7.4 volt batteries. We have a Magpul ASAP cylinder plate, the modified in-house. We have the Prometheus uh, spring guide, the Cage Airsoft uh, M100 spring, which they call the F350 spring. The M90 spring in their range is 330, and the M10 is called the 360. We have the uh, Prometheus piston head, uh, Prometheus piston, a Prometheus type D cylinder. Uh, that's because this is a, a barrel, an inner barrel length of under 300 millimeters. We have the Prometheus purple tappet plate, Prometheus hard gear set, which is standard torque, Prometheus six mil bearing, uh, sorry, bushings. We have our own in house modified cylinder with Air Lab Sorbo pad, and the new Prometheus air nozzle with O ring. Putting the power behind everything, we have the Gate Titan NGRS. Uh, this being a Delta Custom, this is the rear wired version. And up front, giving us the range and accuracy, the Prometheus EG603 steel in a barrel, Prometheus flat hot tensioner, standard not bridge type, Prometheus purple bucking, and then our own little modifications. We've got some uh, Gorilla Super Glue gel, which is part of the hot modification and also a 1.6 mil uh, round brass wire, which we also use for the flat hop modification. The powerhouse of this rifle is the Tokyo Marie Samarium Cobalt motor. So here at Dave's Custom Airsoft, we modify all of our next gen rifles, unless otherwise requested, with a two inch wire tail off the back of a stop tube. This allows you to use any stock that you like and uh, it therefore is much more versatile than the standard uh, electrical terminals on the original stock. So to start with, with this rifle, we're going to remove the original stock and we're going to lipo modify it so that we can use it as we wish. So if you pinch these two tabs on the base of the stock plate, it will come off and then you get the protector. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this next door and we're going to cut this so that it will cover up the wiring and stop it from be being visible. Okay, so now the stock cover is viced up with the bottom just in line with the top of the vise here. We're going to use a hacksaw and we wanna cut just to the right of this line going across here and just to the left of this line here. So if I start, and we're gonna cut down until we're in line with this raised flat section here. Once we've cut down that far, we're gonna take your hacksaw like so, lay it onto the flat section, and then we're gonna cut inwards, nice and slowly, because you don't wanna go all the way through. And that'll come off like so. So you can, if you want, neaten up the edges with a file. So we do this with a large file to start with. Make sure the edge is nice and squared off. It's not visible, but it's nice to do a good job. And then we'll just neaten it up with a fine file as well. Let's do the other side. Once the stock uh, cover has been cut, we need to remove the electrical components from the back of the standard stock. And we're gonna start off by removing, removing the fuse as it's no longer needed. Chuck it in the bin or you can keep it if you want to. 
there's two screws one there one there and also another third screw in the center here if you keep this third screw in the center because it's the same stock um, same screw as is used on the stock tube and they come in very handy as spares should you need them later and the other two screws are good for nothing and usually end up in the bin So once the screws have been removed and the electrical com components are out, we want to remove these contact bars. You can use a pair of pliers or sometimes they just come out by hand as well. That can just go in the bin or you can keep it for a later date. Now we've got to this stage, we want to cut out the center of this stock here. So I'm drawing an invisible line with my screwdriver. That's where we're going to cut. And to do that, we use a Dremel with a drill bit and we literally melt it out. Um, if done correctly, it should be nice and neat. So let's do that. So we've got our drill bit on our Dremel and we want to have it nice and fast so it provides the friction. You want to take it nice and easy as you go around the outside like so. As you can see, we've got a nice neat hole there for the wiring to protrude from. And if you want to, you can neaten that up with a file, which we will do now. Once the stock parts have been modified, simply put the wiring cover back in as before, push the tab up and you're good to go. So you can now use this stock with any AEG, not just next gen recoil rifles. The next thing we're gonna do is remove the upper receiver from the lower receiver so that we can have access to the hot parts. And we, for that, we're gonna use a hole punch and a small hammer. Some of them can be more stiff than others. You wanna do it relatively gently. Make sure you don't lose the pins. They're not captive, so they do come out. Once you've removed the front pin, if you hold the lower receiver in your left hand, pull back on the charging handle, slide forwards, the upper receiver will come off. If you keep your right index finger on the top of a charging handle, it will stop the recoil mechanism from going flying. Once you're at this stage, you can lift the charging handle backwards and up and take it the spring with it, lay it down, try and keep the parts together, it'll save you from losing them. The next part to remove is this black tab at the rear of the recoil assembly on the top of the gearbox. And if we slide that forwards, keep it in your right hand, take the whole recoil assembly, lift it up off the receiver, try and keep it like this, the parts do stay together, saves you having to put it all back together at a later date, lay it down nice and flat, and it will keep all those parts where they should be. You'll find there are two black tabs in the rear of the receiver. One's marked L and one's marked R for left and right and we'll put these back when we come to reassemble the gun later. Inside of the upper receiver, you'll see your hop unit. And the hop unit has a small plastic tab at the front. You want to lift up on that small plastic tab carefully so it doesn't break. And then you can slide the hop unit and in the barrel straight out of the gun. We now want to remove the stock plate from the bottom of the buffer tube and this is held in with two screws. There's also a terminal connector on the rear of the buffer tube which is held in with one screw. Once this screw is removed you want to keep it because you can use it to replace these screws should they get threaded. And on that note be very very careful with these screws they are incredibly soft and they're also put in with Loctite so it might be an idea if you're uh, in somewhere particularly cold to heat it up with a um, hot air gun first and then remove it after. Um, but we have found that the easiest way and the safest way to remove these screws is with just the right size Phillips head that's longer and thinner than it is fatter and wider. Um, but if we hold the rifle like so, you wanna take your left hand and then hold it tightly with your right hand, put the screwdriver into place and as firmly as possible, 
push the both together and slowly turn the screw. Should you actually thread these screws, you can use a flat cutting Dremel disc and cut across ways in the middle of the screw. You can then use a flathead screwdriver to remove these screws. But wherever possible, we want to try and keep them in decent condition. Once these two screws are removed, this plate will come off and you can see your wiring running in these channels in the buffer tube. So we're gonna undo this rear screw as the final one. And under here will be a retention spring. So when you lift this up, there's a spring under there which you wanna remove also. As I said, keep that screw for this part because you can use it as replacements there should you need it. The screw and the connector can go in the bin and you want to snip off using a pair of cutty pliers or scissors or whatever you like really the connector from the rear here like so. So now that we have the electrical terminals cut off the rear of the buff tube we want to use a pair of pliers or just use your finger if it's loose enough to pull this plate rearwards. Making sure that the wires are held flat into the channel, take a AR castle nut wrench and place it into the castle nut. Loosen the castle nut until you can turn it by hand. Again, make sure you're holding the wiring down just in case you actually want to keep this for a later date. We won't need it with this tier three build because we're using the gate Titan, but good to have spares. Once that's completely loose, you you'll uh, be able to pull the wiring out. Uh, but we also want to remove this stock plate here. Sometimes it needs a little bit of persuasion and found the easiest way to do that is take a small flathead and a little hammer. And from either side, there's a little lip about a millimeter that hangs over. So, we're going to take it just enough so it will come off the back. Once the castle nut and stock plate are in the rearwards position, we can take the wiring, uh, get a small bit of leverage underneath it, slide it outwards. And now we want to make sure we're holding it down. We can then unscrew the buffer tube. It's easier if you point it downwards because of these parts don't get in the way and you'll see inside of here you've got your recoil assembly mechanism and then in the rear here you've got your spring guide and the spring because the original spring is actually connected to the piston head in the TM next gens the spring won't come out it will just be stuck there so we'll leave that as it is for now the spring guide is a polymer one the standard and this is getting replaced so we can put that to one side as a spare for later should we wish to use it now we have the stock tube off we want to remove the pistol grip and motor so at the base of the pistol grip you'll see three screws the top screw and the bottom screw hold the base plate in and the middle screw or grub screw is the motor height adjustment screw so you don't want to touch that one you just want to undo the top and bottom one Sometimes it helps to use a pair of pliers to shimmy the plate off. Okay. So you'll find there are two different length screws that go along with this. The long one goes at the back and the short one goes at the front. Once you're inside, you'll see the motor disc. So this being magnetic tends to stick to the motor or fly around. 
So you want to keep hold of that for later. And we'll show you a miniature trick when it comes to putting it back, how to get it to not fly around everywhere. So now you'll see the terminals on the motor with the spade connectors. So you want to use a flathead to lift these up. On the stock guns, positive will be at the front and negative will be at the rear. When we install the MOSFET, that'll be different. It'll be reversed. So you take the motor out. The motor's being replaced in this tier three plus MOSFET package. And once you're inside the grip and you've removed the motor, you'll see at the bottom there are two screws opposite one another. And we want to undo those screws. As you're undoing the final screw, if you push up on the pistol grip, it will put some pressure on the screws and just stop them from turning around freely, which will make it easier to get the grip off. And then, just as that loosens, you need to take the wiring out of the channels there. You have to bend the wiring a little bit to get the spade connectors to come out correctly without damaging them. And there you go, you have your pistol grip off. Now you're at this stage. If you're working on a M4, you won't see this gear here because this works the ambidextrous fire selector that's on the 416. Obviously, as this is a 416, we just need to remove this gear. With the stock wiring, it's much easier than once you have a MOSFET in there. So you simply grab the bottom of it, twist it, and it'll fall out. As this one, they can even just fall out by themselves. So next up, we're going to remove the gearbox pin, which is this pin here. In the Tokyo Marine Next Gen rifles, this pin can be removed from either direction, whereas with other standard AEGs, the pin can only come out in one direction. So we're going to find a pin punch, which is just the right size. They're actually incredibly easy to get out. Some of them will literally just fall out. Hence, there are Prometheus upgrade parts for this, and we also have a DCA part, which is the um, anti-rotation link which is available on our website as well. So we'll take that pin, as you can see it's not captive, it will just come out, put it to one side. Now we're going to remove the gearbox from the shell and you'll see that the bolt catch mechanism will come out as so. Now we have a DCA part to replace this original bolt catch and we'll show you how to install that part now. So once you have the original bolt release mechanism and the DCA um, bolt release, you simply remove this central small pin that holds the um, bolt release into the carrier. It's incredibly delicate, so you don't want to use too much force to remove this roll pin. And then you'll find you pull the two parts away and the spring is stuck to the bolt release and you have one small polymer part left over. If you simply take this spring, put it on the bottom of the DCA bolt release, you can use a little bit of grease to get the spring to stay in place if needed. And then you want to slide the two together, replace the pin that you removed previously, and you can go ahead and reinstall the bolt release catch. To do this, you lift up the gearbox slide the release in so that the silver tab is between the top and the bottom and then undo the previous steps we did by putting the pistol grip back on the motor in the recoil assembly on and there you go you've changed your bolt release for the dca bolt release but now we're going to get back with the tier 3 plus mosfet upgrade and for that we're going to reinstall the original bolt release once we have the bolt release mechanism out we're going to flip the rifle over and remove the screw holding the magazine catch in with a 1.5 millimeter Allen key. Once this is removed, you'll see a spring underneath 
And if this part, uh, so if this magazine catch, sorry, gets stuck in the hole there, you just want to use a pair of pliers to pull it out. Sometimes they can be a bit stiff in the factory. If you pull the sprig out the top, and then when you just lift up the receiver, the base of the magazine catch should stay where it was put. You can then remove the gearbox from the receiver. So if we push the fire selector up to roughly about semi-automatic, shimmy it forwards, and then pull it forwards, watching the wires don't get caught. It's a little bit harder because the original spring is there, but it's not particularly difficult. We're going to lay the gearbox in front of you with the rear on your left and the front on your right. We now want to remove the bolt stop mechanism. So we're going to hold your finger over the screw, lift up on the spring, because this spring is incredibly easy to lose. It's non-standard and it's a nightmare if you lose it. So keep, keep your finger there until it's released. Once it's released, you can take your Phillips and undo the screw that holds it into position. Once that screw is out, you can keep it to one side with the spring. And then lift up this plate, which says two on it. Put it to one side. And then the tab under here slides off forwards, revealing underneath a large Phillips screw, which again, you need to remove. You've now removed the entire bolt release mechanism from the gearbox. Now we've removed the crosshead screw from the recoil assembly, we're going to use a Torx size 10 to remove the other four screws in the gearbox shell. There are two short ones, which is uh, the frontmost one and the rearmost one. And then the two in the middle are slightly longer. So keep these to one side. Once we have these screws out, we can take the top of the gearbox shell and release it from the bottom, nice and gentle. Put the gearbox shell to one side and then you'll be able to see the gearbox in its entirety. If you lift up the piston mechanism and cylinder, you can then begin to take all the internal parts out because the majority of them are being replaced by new parts. As we're installing the gate height and MOSFET, we need to completely remove the electronics and the trigger mechanism, the um, selector plate and the cutoff lever as well. So to do that, we're gonna remove the trigger. Now, if you're fitting a DCA trigger, We'll show you how to do that now. So the original trigger spring is held into the trigger like so. There's a small raised notch and that holds the trigger spring in place. And to lay it down, you simply push the trigger into place and then flick the spring into the front of a gearbox shell. To install the DCA trigger, you do exactly the same thing. So put the screw through the, um, sorry, spring through the notch so it sits on the raised area. Lay the trigger in, put the spring down and the DCA trigger is installed. Now the trigger's removed, we can remove the entire trigger assembly and that is held in place with one screw. If we take that screw out, lift up the trigger mechanism and pull out the wiring. You want to keep this screw that holds in the trigger mechanism because we find that is the best screw to use to hold the gate tight and trigger board in. We then need to remove the cutoff lever and the cutoff lever is held in place with one screw which is here.
as we said previously, the cutoff lever is no longer needed because we're going to use the gate Titan, which electronically controls the gearbox instead of mechanically. So we can put those parts to one side. You take the original shims, keep them to one side. They're good quality shims and you can use them with the Prometheus gear set, no problem. Some of these Tokyo Miri guns have more shims than others. Some we've seen have literally no more than two spring uh, shims in the entire gearbox. Once we've got the two shells to this point, we need to remove these polymer bushings. Some of them you may find they're actually connected to the original gears. If that's the case, they can happily stay there, no problems. So if you push the gearbox shell to the other side, and then just simply push these bushings through to remove them. You'll find that uh, this square part here, which works the recoil mechanism, will come out when you flip it over. You simply put that to one side with the recoil mechanism parts. So that was the numbered catches that we removed earlier. Once we turn this part of the gearbox shell over, we can now remove the selector plate. And then you'll be able to push the remaining bushings out. We're not using these gears, we're not using these bushings, so they can all go to one side to be kept as spares. We are using the original anti-reversal latch and spring, so keep that. We're not using the tappet plate, so remove that. We are using the recoil tappet plate spring, so keep that. And this entire mechanism and assembly we're not using, so again, goes into spares. We are using the select plate, so you want to keep that. We are using the original trigger, so you keep that. And obviously the screws. What we're going to do now is just prep this gearbox shell by cleaning it. So we can use panel wipe for that. We can use um, also warm water, washing up liquid, and a wire brush or wire wool. Just takes the surface roughness off and creates a nicer area to work on. So we're going to go through to the bathroom now and uh, clean up this gearbox shell. Once we've removed the surface roughness on the gearbox shell, we're going to install the Prometheus 6mm sintered steel bushings. And it's worth bearing in mind that the original gearbox shell is designed for 5.9 millimeter bushings. You can lay the bushing flat and use a large hole punch to literally forcibly punch them in. However, you run the risk of bending the gearbox shell, which is actually very soft when you do that. So the way we do it is we use a vise and some uh, tool bits to literally press them together. And we'll show you how we do that now. So what we've done, we modified a bit this wise for easier press these bushings into the gearbox shell. So you can a bit grease it to get it easier in. And once you put it in, make sure it's relatively in the same level so it's not offset on any side and then you can start you have to keep eye on all the times on that bushing if it's if it's going straight again uh, again is a wise and then you can slowly start pressing it also keep eye on on the sh on the gearbox shell if is it if is it straight and very slowly so can see 
it's pretty nice pressed into the shell so once we pressed our bushings into the gearbox shells uh, we started with the shimming uh, we used a Prometheus, Prometheus gears uh, specially made for next generation recoils uh, what to say about the shimming uh, important thing is uh, be careful uh, which shims you, you use uh, as you can see we have uh, two types we have a uh, bigger ones and smaller ones uh, it's really really important to to uh, keep them in the, in the in the right place and don't use them on the on the wrong way of the shafts I will show you later so as a first gear uh, we are taking this in the middle first thing what you will do you will put a gear there you will close your gearbox shell you will take a flat screwdriver and through by this hole you will check how wobble that gear is you should check uh, how much space uh, remain on the both sides of, of the gear on the shaft so there shouldn't be more than uh, one and a half millimeter so one and a half one and a half three millimeters together uh, what is important about about shim this gear is how I said before uh, in the bottom you can use a uh, wider or bigger shims uh, it's for a better leaning of that gear on the, on the bushing so it will stay a longer and it will be more durable but at the same time you have to be extremely careful and keep it on mind don't use these bigger shims on this side it's because there is a working uh, top of the plate and other parts and what's happening it's causing some some issues with the feeding and other other things so uh, once we start shimming with this gear uh, we will start with a shim which is thickness about 0 0.2 millimeters or 0 0.3 uh, you will see uh, which one will fit there uh, if you will use any shims about thickness 0 0.2 0 0.1 millimeter be careful uh, never never ever put these uh, shims uh, on the end they they always must be between other shims so you will have a for example a shim 0 0.3 then shim 0 0.1 and then 0 0.2 so keep it like this and it will stay longer uh, once you will put a uh, first shim uh, on this side of the shaft you can put it in the gearbox you can close it and because it's starting of your shimming you don't have to screw it together we will do it later and you will try spin the gear if it's spinning freely that's correct that's, that's how it should be uh, then you will open the gearbox again you will add there a next shim again close it try to spin it if it's still enough wobble you don't have to you don't have to screw it uh, then once you will do this side you will start with the other side and you are going ahead till it's not perfectly shimmed uh, when you would like to try it uh, how it's if it's properly shimmed you have to close gearbox at least by three screws so in this case we have one here second one here and third is here uh, if you want you can use this but there is a Phillips Phillips uh, head screw so three screws here are just enough so you will tight screws you will hold gearbox shell together you will try to spin that gear if that gear is spinning it's correctly shim if not you have to take out at least one shim uh, start with the with the thinnest shim which you use which is 0 0.1 if you use take it apart uh, check if, if it's uh, shimmed co correctly if that gear is not scratching any any parts of the gearbox again close it make a last check screw all these three screws together into the gearbox and again check a spin if it's spinning and the gear is relatively in the middle of the gearbox uh, then it's correctly shimmed so this is first gear uh, 
Then we are getting on this on the sector gear or piston gear, which is this one. As you can see, here is a here is a cam, which uh, is working together with the, with the cut of lever or with the uh, gate tighten. It's important to use these smaller shims. Again, don't use these bigger ones. It can affect uh, affect. Uh, it can cause any uh, some issues to to gate tighten or to your cut off lever. So uh, the shimming is the same like with this gear. But here is a very important thing. You have to look after after this 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 uh, space. If it's not touching this gear, there should be a really really tiny gap. I would say like 0.1 millimeter is just enough. If there will be bigger gap, it can cause uh, damage of your gears, especially these these teeth here and these teeth here on this gear. So uh, shimming uh, shimming process is the same like with this one. Uh, again, you will close it. You will use these three screws. You will try to spin it if it's spinning freely. That's correct. That's brilliant. Again, you have to check if that if that gear is uh, just in the middle of the gearbox, roughly. Uh, why is this important? Because uh, the piston is just in the middle of the gearbox. Uh, here are the gears. Uh, here are two uh, teeth on the gear uh, like this. In standard AEG it's like 32 to 1 so here is not that much important if is it in the middle but it's better to have a have a dead gear in the middle because it can slow down your top of the plate or cause any other issues so uh, keep gears always in the middle uh, once you have uh, shimmed these two you can take them out and try this one it's a bevel gear here in the bottom again you will try how it's spinning if it's roughly in the middle and the process is the completely the same as with these other two gears here is very very important thing on this side of the of the gear use these uh, bigger wider wider shims uh, here use only these thin ones because as you can see there are there are teeth really really close to these to these shims so if you would use uh, these wider shims you can cause uh, you can cause some damages to to bevel gear and to the motor so uh, one small tip uh, what is good to use is a flat screwdriver and if you have stainless uh, stainle blade uh, stainless blade is really good for take off shims from the gears and uh, flat screwdriver is good for a spin. At the same time, what I like to do is uh, I put a bit of grease on the top of the screwdriver and I grease that gear to, to hold shims uh, in the place. So they will not be falling apart somewhere. So you, you know you have them on the, on the right place. Uh, once we done shimming, we can put all, all gears to get, uh, together back into the gearbox and you can see it's spinning now and let's see what it will do now so we will tighten it by these three screws and now we are going to see uh, gears how they are spinning Okay, so now the shimming is done and you're happy with it, you can open up the gearbox shell again. You want to remove any shims from your workspace, just in case any come off and get lost. Uh, it's much easier to keep track of things. So keeping the shims where they are on each gear, you want to place the gears apart from each other on your workspace with the shims wherever you put them previously. If you hold them like that, it just stops the shims coming off. Now we need to lay the gate tighten into the gearbox shell. And for this, we need to modify the gearbox shell. 
At home, you can use a Dremel. Uh, we tend to use our milling machine. Um, but essentially what we want to do is remove part of this post here, about half of this post going up vertically so that the wiring has space because it's a very tight fit to try and squeeze all the wiring into the original hole there. Um, if, if at home you're using a Dremel, you can start off cutting a small space, lay the wiring down and just go backwards and forwards. But um, yeah, we'll take you through to the milling machine now and show you how we're going to cut that off. Once you've milled or dremeled a slot for the wiring to lay, and you can make that slot as large or as small as you like sim by simply laying the wiring down and seeing how uh, it fits, how it suits you. If you want an exact guide for the installation of this Gate Titan MOSFET, go on to YouTube and search Gate Titan Next Gen Install, or go on Gate's website and there's a fantastic, really in-depth video. Just to save time, we're not going to go through the uh, absolute entirety of this uh, MOSFET installation. But as you can see, the primary things to watch out for are that the thin red wire and the black wire going to the rear are not protruding from above when you put both gearbox shells together and you look inside, you shouldn't be able to see any wiring at all. So that just means the motor won't damage the wiring as the motor is moving. Also, you want to check in uh, the portion just above the trigger that the wiring doesn't get caught by the trigger as the trigger moves. So when the trigger's moving backwards and forwards, you want to make sure it's not catching on this heat shrink section here or on the wire at the top. Um, the screw underneath, you'll find that uh, you'll need to use the plastic washer that's included in the set and that, as we've suggested, when you use the original screw, it will protrude slightly, so we're going to go next door now and we're going to just slightly dremel that down until it's flush. Okay, now the MOSFET wiring is laid and we're happy with it, we can move on to putting the mechanical parts of the gearbox together. So we're going to start by installing the AirLab Sorbophane pad. And according to AirLab's website, we need to remove the second and third teeth off the rear of the piston. Um, so on this Prometheus piston, that will be to completely remove this tooth here and this tooth there. You can do that with a Dremel, you can do it with a file, you can do it with a Stanley knife. Um, it's obviously, so long as you're careful. Uh, however, we'll do this on the mill and we'll show you that in just a moment. To install the sorbophane pad, you have to scratch up the inside of the cylinder head. So this is one of our DCA modified cylinder heads. As you can see, it's been milled um, to a lower depth to allow for the sorbophane pad. And we'll show you that as well in just a second. So we're just going to go back out the back and we'll put these parts together. And then the rest of it, we'll just finish off with a Stanley knife. So firstly, we want to take our DCA modified cylinder head and we want to scratch it. You can use a screwdriver. So I'm just using a flat head here. You want to scratch it just like this. So you keep turning it, scratch it crossways. You're not trying to dig into it, but you're just trying to give it a bit of a key so that the glue can stick. We use Gorilla Super Glue, we've never had any problems with it, so I'd recommend that you use the same. Once that's done, use a bit of panel wipe or degreasing spray from Abbey, or any other brand of course. And we'll just wipe that and leave it on the side to dry. Then you want to take the black side of the Sorbophane pad from AirLab, and you're very, very carefully in the same sort of cross pattern, Put some very light scores onto the sorbophane pad. Just enough 
to allow that glue to slightly absorb into the surface. And again, a small bit of panel wipe or degreasing spray. Give it a blow. Let that Let that dry off. And then we're going to get our Gorilla Super Glue. And we're going to liberally put it in the side of our modified cylinder head. Make sure we're all around the edges. Give it a second or two to work a bit of its magic. And then push the two together. Spin it round so there's a we know the glue is getting everywhere it should do and then we just need to clamp it up in the vise until it dries so we don't want to do it up too tight because we'll, we'll bend the components but just enough when you see the black of the salt buffet start to uh, compress you know it's tight enough and then just leave that there a good sort of 15-20 minutes and it should be dry now that we've removed the second and third teeth from the Prometheus piston to correct the AOE with the sorbophane pad, and we've got the sorbophane pad drying. We're going to take the Prometheus piston head and its um, spacer, bearing spacer, the internal component, and then the bar going through. And we want the flat edge facing towards the teeth and the teeth facing towards us. So it's flat towards you, teeth towards you. Push it inside and then check at the top, keeping pressure on the inside of the piston head there. Check at the top to make sure you can actually see the uh, spacer that you've just pushed in there to there. And then take your piston head, put some blue Loctite onto the screw. This is just to stop it from coming undone, but uh, is enough that it will allow you to take it off should you need to. Place your piston head over the piston. Without making too much mess. Put the piston head screw in and you want to do it up nice and tight. We've seen a very small amount of these piston heads shearing uh, with use and that's primarily due to the lack of Loctite. So be sure to use blue Loctite with this one, folks. And you want it nice and tight. And when you're happy with it, just give it a quick check. Make sure that the polymer part of the piston head doesn't spin around and that everything's lined up as it should be. So now we've put the piston assembly together, we can go ahead and install the other components of the gearbox. So as you can see, I've very lightly greased the gearbox shell, avoiding the gate tighten sensors. We use Abbey LT2 grease or gun grease because this grease tends not to interfere with the gate tighten sensors. So you can put it on relatively liberally, but um, not too much. So first of all, we're gonna grease the trigger because the grease that was on there probably was taken off by your fingers whilst you've been working on the gun. Put the trigger spring into place. Lay the trigger down. So let's push the trigger in, flick the spring up, the trigger stays in place. And then we're gonna take our gears, lightly grease them all around and then we're going to lay them into place as well. Make sure that you keep the shims exactly where you left them before will save you time. Take our anti-reversal latch with the spring seated in this direction. So the curved edge has the hook of the latch on. Lay the AR latch into place and to install the other gear, pull the latch down, hold on the AR latch and put the gear into place. Just to test the latch, move the gears clockwise. If they don't move, the latch is doing its job. And then anti-clockwise, you'll hear the latch click and the gears will turn. We'll then take our cylinder, cylinder head, and lay them in again with the two grooves facing upwards. We've already greased the piston a little on the teeth and on the runners, and that's more than enough. And we'll Put that into place, making sure that the teeth of the grooves on the piston line up with the grooves in your gearbox shell, and that will allow your piston to move freely inside the gearbox. 
grease up our final gear. It's a bit of a fiddle to get this gear into place and you want to make sure that the shims have not come loose. A little bit of grease always helps to keep them in place. The raised section of the gear to the delayer needs to point upwards towards you because the tappet plate will work off of that part of the gear. We now need to place the tappet plate. So we're just gonna grease it slightly, not too much. People, you can use a brush or wear gloves when you're doing teching to not get grease all over yourself, but you lose a bit of feeling that way. So it's often easier just to wash your hands afterwards. You see on the O-ring nozzle here, there's a brass pin. And in the top of the tappet plate, there's a slight gap. Just line those two up, making sure that they sit flush together. If they don't sit flush, you have to take the whole gearbox apart and move it. So it's worth getting it right now. It takes a tiny bit of force and then it will sit in there like so. There's a bit of a knack to getting this to sit into position. So what we're going to do is very, very lightly grease the spring lay it into a channel and we're gonna you'll see there's a notch on the tappet plate the notch on the tappet plate will go into the spring we'll lift the cylinder head assembly up slightly push the tappet plate into place and hopefully it'll all stay there and we'll get it right first time that's it When you have the air nozzle and tappet plate in position, you want to push on the air nozzle, to make sure the tappet plate moves freely. You also want to make sure that the shim on the sector gear is sat above the tappet plate and doesn't impede on its movement at all. Again, as before, check that the pistons on the rails and we're good to move on to the next step. Okay, now we're going to install the bolt stop block which sits on the protrusion just in front of the trigger here so it sits upwards and when it's in position it will wobble a little but not too much we're then going to install the top of the gate titan board simply line up these metal tabs with the plastic tabs on the bo bottom of the board if you've consulted the gate titan installation video it will cover this as well line those up and then when you're happy with them all in place push the board down hold the trigger board trigger into place make sure the trigger moves freely we haven't checked the air compression simply for the fact that we know stock prometheus parts always have excellent um, air seal and compression capabilities when put together like this so we'll take your other half of your gibble shell we've already greased ours in the interest of time and place it from the rear first push it down into place and make sure all the gears are sat into the bushings correctly and that the gearbox the two halves of the gearbox shell sit flush take your screws as before long in front of the trigger long above the black wire to the motor short front right and short back also take the crosshead screw from the bolt stop mechanism and lay that into place as well. Tighten up these screws, give them a pinch but not too tight. We want to be able to take them off again in future should we need to be able to get into the gearbox again. And then we're going to tighten up all of these screws. We're now going to install the, re the bolt stop assembly components, which is one spring, these two metal parts and the screw. So we're going to start off with this hooked part, hook facing upwards, under, inside this channel here, like so. 
and then you can take your second metal part with the extension to the left small protrusion there which will join and the two should move together and take your spring flat edge down first so put your think thumb over the stop the spring from running away from you and then this lower section of the spring hooks into this half moon shape on the block that we put in earlier and nice and carefully do the screw up to make sure that the spring stays where the spring belongs again tight but not too tight you can test the bolt stop components by pushing forwards and allowing them to spring back under our own tension. We're now going to clean the selector plate with some degreaser so that the selector plate sticker will stick to the selector plate. Um, this is needed because that's how the Titan recognises where the selector plate is in relation to the gearbox and it just stops the sticker from coming off on its own accord. Again, if you've seen the Gate Titan video, you'll see that the sticker lays and is the perfect size for this square here. So just lay that down, take the stickers that come in the set with the Gate Titan, pull one off. I tend to try not to touch the sticker too much, it gets rid of some of the sticky glue. Hold it into place and then just with a little bit of kitchen towel or with your t-shirt or anything you've got around just push on it and rub it a bit make sure it's in place give it a move make sure it's not going to come off all good so if we flip the gearbox over now we have a gate tight installed you can just put the select plate straight into position you don't have to remove any internal parts which is really handy so now we're at this point we can take this completed gearbox and put it back into our receiver. To do this, we're gonna put our selectors onto semi-automatic. We're gonna take the two tails of the wire and lay them into this hole at the bottom rear of the receiver. So if you take both wires, you tuck them through. And then you wanna take these motor wires, shimmy it along, put the motor wires into place. Make sure the selected plate stays where it should be. And then with a nice positive click, the gearbox will lock into place. Once you've got it completely set, you need to remember to reinstall the bolt catch. So for that, you just lift up the front of the gearbox as before, lay the bolt catch in with the silver part of the gearbox in between these two tabs. So, like so, drop it down. And then when you've got it in place, check underneath to make sure that when you pull the bolt catch tab, it's sat above the gearbox tab. So you push it in to release it and it will pull the gearbox tab down. Next thing is the gear for the Ambi fire selector. So with this, now we've got the gate tighten wire and it's going to be more difficult than it was previously. There we go. Once you've got the bar through the wiring, you want to lay it onto the two channels on the gearbox shell. and you want to make sure that either side of the fire selectors are in exactly the same position. When the bar is sat correctly in place, and the gearbox needs to be aligned, you can put the gearbox pin in. So when nothing else is screwed in, this should just go straight in. And as I said previously, you can push it from either side. So if you keep your gearbox in this upside down position, 
you can now take your pistol grip and the red tab will go in through the rear larger hole and black tab through the rear, through the front center hole. Before we do that, we will bend the spade connectors for the motor because it's easier to do that now whilst we're, we have the pistol grip off than it is later. So you literally get a pair of pliers and delicately bend them so we're at a 90 degree angle. You bend them inwards, so the channel going down the center of the spade connector is the inside. So you want to bend, bend towards that. Same with the red one. Now we can tuck these wires through into the pistol grip. If you're lucky, the pistol grip screws will stay in place in the grip. Makes it easier to install it. Making sure, double checking that those fire selectors are pointing the same direction and the bar through the middle with the gears is sat in the same place. Also pull, the, pull on the wires to make sure they're not stuck between the gearbox shell and the base of the pistol grip. And then push the pistol grip into place. And take screwdriver and screw in the two screws inside the pistol grip to hold the pistol grip in place. And they'll also hold the gear between the two fire selectors in place as well. As you do these up, make sure that the gearbox pin through the gearbox is snapped correctly, as it's these screws being done up which will put tension on that gearbox pin and stop it from coming out. You also want to, once you've done them both up nice and tight, check the fire selectors, check that when you move one, the other moves and they're at the same position. And also if you find that the selector goes incredibly stiff, you might want to turn off these screws uh, just a small amount, as sometimes if they're too tight, it can make the fire selector overly stiff. So, nice and tight on these ones to start with. And then we'll check our fire selector. And as I move this side, you can see that that side will move into the same position. So we're on safe, semi, automatic. Also, You'll find that now we have the gate tighten, the trigger will pull on every setting. So now we're going to install the motor. We want the red tab pointing rearwards and the blank tab, which is the negative, facing forwards. There's a specific way to lay the wiring inside of this pistol grip. The black wire is laid towards the base in the right hand corner with the piston, uh, sorry, with the air nozzle on your left. You want the black wire laid tucked away nicely in the corner and coming up on the right hand side of the ridge at the back of the pistol grip. So essentially all this does is it stops the wiring from impeding the movement of the motor and stops the motor from chewing up the wire. And then likewise, you want the red wire on the left of the ridge down the back of the pistol grip, again, not getting in the way. You then take your pistol, your motor, drop it into your pistol grip. You then want to take your red wire and you can use a pair of pliers at this point if you wish and put that into place. Hooked pliers are often easier for this. You want to be careful you don't damage this heat shrink on the spade connectors. You then want to take the black wire, which is the longer of the two, and repeat the same process. It's a little bit fiddly. Sometimes you might find the alignment's a bit off. If it is, just start again, take the motor out, take the spade connector out, just play around with it until you're happy with it. So you might find that some spade connectors like that one was very tight, the red one was relatively loose. So when you're at this position, you want to make sure the, gear, the motor moves freely up and down on the spring tension, and isn't it impeded or stuck in any way. We now need to put on the 
motor cover. The easiest way to do this is get a bit of grease, put it on top of the motor, take the motor cover, stick it down. And then you want to lift the gearbox slightly up so that the top of the motor is essentially flat. Take your motor base plate and now the black wire and the red wire need to be in front of and behind this tab. The easiest way is to start at this angle, drop down behind the black wire, shim it backwards and forwards down and then goes your pistol, your pistol grip base plate. And then take the long screw, put it in the rear and you take the short screw, put it into the front. Keep your finger down, holding the tension on the motor as you're doing it. And I'll suggest it's best not to release the tension in your thumb until you've got both screws in to make sure that those spade connectors don't come off at any point. So when you're happy with those two, you can move on to the next step. The next step is to reinstall your magazine catch. So take the long bar through this flat section, drop it down and turn it over. Take the spring, push it into place. Take the section with the two small holes and you'll see it's a specific shape. It'll only sit one way onto the top of the magazine bar. Push it down into place and hold it with your thumb under tension. You don't need any Loctite or anything for this. This screw will not undo itself. And then tighten it up as before. If you keep it under spring, under tension with your thumb, it makes it easier to screw on and it also means that you won't over tighten it or under tighten it. Give it a little final pinch, pull the push the magazine catch in make sure it moves freely and now we are going to move on to plug the mosfet into gate control station to set the settings on the mosfet and we'll then put the buffer tube assembly on and run the gearbox once you have gate control station open on the laptop or on your phone ideally on the laptop you want to take your two connectors from the rear. We have a solderless connector here, which we use for this purpose. So we just put these in to place. And then you can take your USB lead, plug the rifle into the GCS, and it'll light up on the right here saying the MOSFET is recognized. Always press update just to give you the latest software on the MOSFET. And that'll take uh, roughly 30 seconds to go through. I'm going to go over to sensors to start with, and we're going to calibrate the trigger. So you just follow the cues that come up on screen. So you need to have the trigger off of safe, pull the trigger all the way, release the trigger, press save. And then you want to pull the trigger just to make sure. We usually set our triggers on 110 or 120. So we go 110. I want to make sure the bolt catch sensor is ready and the bolt catch sensor is on. You can turn it off if you want the bolt stop to not function. Then we go to the select calibration. Press AR15 type because this is not a scar. We'll put the selector on to safe. Semi. Auto. Back to semi. And then save. You then see that you can make fine calibration adjustments if you need to. But for now, safe semi is in the perfect position, auto comes up perfectly, and safe comes up perfectly. You then need to go to the settings. We always set our settings the same, and I'll show you what they are. So it's safe semi automatic. For pre cocking, we turn it off and unselect with select box because the um, pre cocking can be turned on with the trigger if that's on. Pre cocking boost low, burst mode full, burst free. And these burst functions don't have any impact unless you actually select burst in the top. Roth stabilization 100%, sniper delay off, battery protection lipo, battery cell auto, low battery warning 3.2, 
30 round limit off, cycle detection on, equaliser level 2, active brake automatic and gear ratio is standard. If you find that your gate tighten comes up with constant low battery warnings, which many of our customers have, we can select low battery warning to off. Um, because we've had that issue on multiple gate titans now, we tend to leave it off, but you can leave it on and see what happens. So now we're going to take it next door, put the buffer tube and spring in, and see if the gearbox turns. So now that we've got the gate titan set up, we can go ahead and install the spring and buffer tube assembly. The spring has tighter coils one side than the other, and it's the side with the tighter coils that you want to put the spring guide in. The spring guide has a hole going through the center, and that sits inside of the buffer tube rod, like so. This customer has decided to have a, a ASAP sling plate added, and that sits with the tabs facing forwards and the ring at the rear. We then slide the spring into the piston, center of the piston, Screw on the buffer tube. We want to screw it in as far as it will go. And then because we've corrected the angle of engagement on the piston, we want to unscrew it two turns from experience. This helps to get the gearbox running uh, to start with, and we'll tighten it up once we've actually fired a few shots. So take a 7.4 volt battery. We're using the 1100 7.4 volt battery from Neutrol. Plug it in. Wait for the MOSFET to beep, let you know it's there. Pull the trigger and fingers crossed, you'll go and will work. Ah, it works. And now we can put it onto automatic and make sure automatic works. Semi again. And safe. Excellent. So if you have any issues or the, the motor sounds like it's particularly screechy and needs some adjustment, you'll find the central screw at the base of the pistol grip. If you tighten and loosen that, in small increments until your gearbox sounds nice and smooth, then your motor height adjustment will be correct and you'll be good to go. So now we know that the gearbox runs, we can unplug the battery, tighten the buffer tube up Ooh, as far as it will go, and then we can leave the wiring and the ASAP plate and castle nut to the rear. We're going to move on now and do the hot modification. So take your hop unit assembly, remove the spring from the middle, take the C-clip off, you can use a fingernail for this or sometimes you might need a flathead screwdriver. You see a pin, this pin here, which holds the hop arm in place. You need to push that pin out. Some are easier than others again. This one's not too bad. Put that to one side. Give it a tap and your hop arm will come out. You'll see your hop nub in there, standard black TM one. Not using it, so you can push it to one side. And then we need to do uh, the hardest thing about this hop setup, which is literally getting the hop unit off of the stock barrel. For some reason, Tokyo Marina seems to use some magical fairy grease to put it on there. So need, sometimes it takes a, a fair bit of welly to get it off. Make sure when you're trying to get it off, you put your thumb onto this tab here and push inwards so that if that does start to bend, it won't bend too far, in which case it will snap, and then you need a new hop unit. Off it comes, eventually. Take the original bucking, put it to one side, and then there'll be a brass collar. You can take that off. So now we've got our Prometheus EG603 barrel. Because this is a Delta Custom, this inner barrel is 275.5 millimeters long. The Japanese like to have a 0.5 in there, just to be exact. We've got the Prometheus purple bucking, the Prometheus flat hop tensioner. It's best to use the black tensioner if you can, although the purple one will work just, just as well. We also have the hop arm, which we'll need to adjust using Gorilla Glue Gel. So we're going to take these parts next door and show you what we do with them. So we're going to take our Gorilla Super Glue Gel and the hop arm, and we're going to fill the groove through here with gel. We want the gel to come over the each edge and over the top and then we're going to shape it using the file once dry. Don't use any 
uh, super glue accelerator to dry it, let it dry naturally. And also when you're filing it, file it off in tiny increments as well. You now need to take the black hop-up tensioner and the brass bar that we discussed in the beginning of the video and put the bra brass bar through the eye of the tensioner. Essentially what this is going to do is make the tensioner compress less and give you more hop. We then need to put this brass bar into the vise, cut it with pliers and then file it with a fine file until it's flush with the side of the tensioner. We don't want it protruding at all from either side of the tensioner because it will prevent the tensioner from moving up and down freely. So once you have your brass pin in the vise, you want to do it up tightly, not too tight. Remember it's brass, it will uh, deform. So you need to get the file and you just basically want to put a flat edge on either side from where you've cut it. It probably will be a little bit rough and uh, yeah, be nice and gentle with it best to do a little bit at a time, go around the edges and then turn it over, repeat the process, put it in the tensioner, keep checking it inside the tensioner and then we'll show you in a moment the completed article. So next up we need to turn the Prometheus purple bucking inside out and take off the uh, raised portions of the bucking. So with that we're going to use a large crosshead screwdriver, I'm going to pinch one of the edges and then pull it until it's inside out, push it onto the top of the screwdriver and then we're going to take it over to the vise, clamp it up and then you're going to use a sanding attachment to remove this raised section here and if you want to as well and what we often do is also remove this groove there. And then to turn it back in the right direction, just ta-da! We then need to take three or four millimeters off the back of the bucking because it's uh, too long to work with the flat hop setup. The easiest way to do this is lay a Stanley blade down on the rear, push down, and then use it as if it were a saw. And you get a nice straight cut. We need to remove the wings from either side of the tensioner. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to lay it uh, like so. Put the Stanley blade just above the wing and then push down to chop the wing off. Once the glue is completely dried on the hop arm, you want to use a file and very, very carefully file the edges away so that the glue and the black hop arm are essentially one piece. So you want it to be nice and flat and uniform shape either side and on top. So you want to file the top till it's completely flat and try and make sure you stay central and flat, flat onto it. Again, on the edges and the back. And we'll show you the completed article. So this is the completed hop arm, as you can see, the Gorilla Super Glue Gel, which was placed in the middle, has been shaped with a file, a very fine file and very delicately around each edge and along the top to leave a flat edge. What we're going to do is put the hop unit back together and we're going to keep testing the hop until this is the right height. Essentially what you want to do is keep filing this flat portion here lower and lower until the hop completely off is not protruding through the hop window. And We'll, now we'll get on to reassembling the hop unit and we'll see what this one looks like as it is. So now we're going to reassemble the hop unit. So a square of silicon oil, the backing on, twist around. Another little square of silicon oil. You want the groove 
facing towards the bottom of the hot unit and the hot window which you can feel there towards the top so, very delicately shimmy you in a barrel and so when the hop and barrel are in the same correct position the slots on the side of the barrel will become obvious and line up with where the c-clip sits in the hop unit so once we're happy with the alignment we want to take the c-clip you see it's got a notched area in the front there which lines up so you can only put it in one way Clip the sleek put the c-clip in and then tiny adjustments left and right and the c-clip will sit flush when the c-clip sits flush you can be sure that the barrel is in the correct alignment we then want to take the brass collar slide it over the top of the barrel depending on what in the barrel you're using it might be a little bit stiff to get it over the muzzle um, if it is lean it up against the side of the piece of wood and push it on that way you can then put the main spring back on and now all we've got left is our hop tensioner our hop arm and the pin for the hop arm so what we're going to do now is put the hop tensioner into the hop window having already cut the wings off we just want to see if it is too long or just the right length now looking here you can push down on the tensioner you can use a flathead screwdriver or you can use the hop arm and you want to look through the barrel and see how the tensioner is coming down into the barrel if it's offset you need to adjust the hop unit or if it's not coming through enough or too much you also need to adjust so i'm going to put the hop arm in now put the pin in turn the hop to zero and then we'll see if we can show you the picture through the hop window you can see in the top there that the tensioner is protruding through the barrel just a little and this is with the hop full off so what we need to see when we look down the barrel is that that tensioner hardly shows at all because when we put the hop full on you'll see the tensioner moves down now when we put the hop full on the tensioner is far lower in the barrel and that means that if it goes down too far the gun will jam so we're going to take that hop arm out and file it lower down we're going to keep going backwards and forwards until when the hop is on zero we can hardly see that hop tensioner when we're at that point we'll know we have the perfect angle on it so now that we have the hop unit assembled we've looked through the barrel window at the end put the end of the, the muzzle of the barrel up to the light and with the hop setting on zero you want to just see a very small fraction of tensioner coming down into the hop window and when you turn the hop all the way on as you see the tensioner coming down into inside the window you want to see that it's straight and level that it's symmetrical and then you know your hop will do what it's supposed to do so now we're going to install the hop unit assembly and out in a barrel into the upper receiver so take your upper receiver put the barrel into the outer barrel slide it to the front and then just when you get before you need to apply some spring tension take this plastic tab with the protruded end facing forwards into this which sits into this gap and you can push the hop unit into place and then when you push the hop unit in you'll see that plastic tab sits completely flush with the receiver and then put that to one side then take your lower receiver you still don't need to touch uh, the any more of the buffer tube because we're going to FPS test the rifle and that saves you having to take the rifle apart, do soldering, etc, etc. So we need to reinstall the recoil assembly parts. So as we had them before, nicely laid out and together, we're going to try and keep them together still. So we're going to slide this black tab into the rear of the gearbox shell here and then slide the whole mechanism forwards so that this rod sits inside of this groove here and we're going to take the black tab with the little eye and you want the cutout section facing towards the rear then you lift up this rod slightly push this black tab on and slide this tab so it sits in with the back of the receiver there or the gearbox shell and make sure that this part moves freely you can then reinstall your 
charging handle. And we do have butterfly charging handles, uh, own brand, Dave's Custom Airsoft product coming out very soon. So keep an eye out on our website for that. And we'll do an installation video when that when the time comes. But uh, you should have enough information in this video to be able to install that part um, in any case. So once the charging handle is in place, you can bend the spring into position. And again, just make sure that the whole assembly moves with the charging handle. To put the two halves together, we simply need to keep the lower half in our right hand, take the upper half in the left, and then slide the two halves together. The bolt catch might need a little bit of work to get it out. Once you're roughly two centimeters from the rear, you take your L and R marked tabs, obviously left for left and right for right, and you place them into the black grooves in the upper receiver. They are fiddly and this may take several attempts for you, but when they're sat correctly, the gearbox and the receiver and upper, upper and lower receiver will go together like so. And you take the receiver pin, put it into place, and you can, if you wish, use a very small hammer and very gently so you don't break the receiver. Tap that pin into place. Sometimes you need to give it a little bit of encouragement in terms of alignment. The pin will be in as such. Charge the rifle, you can see your hop up for more hop, down for less hop. So to start testing, we're gonna make sure it's completely hop full off. And now we're gonna go over to the range and FPS test. Right, so we have the rifles on the range now, and just before we FPS test them, we're going to test the bolt release mechanism works or the bolt stop mechanism. So if you look inside of the receiver here, you'll see a small silver tab towards the rear there. We're gonna put the gun onto semi-automatic and pull the trigger at the same time as we press down onto this tab and the gun should stop firing, which it does. So we know the bolt release mechanism is working. We're gonna push the bolt release forwards. The gun should continue to fire now and not hold open. So we're now gonna take the hop and um, on this stock rifle, the hop full on. Okay, so the lowest reading there was 241 FPS. And then we're going to take this rifle, because we performed our hop modification on it, Hop all the way on, we'll jam the rifle. So we're gonna take it about halfway. So we're gonna take it all the way to 10 and then pull it off, say three and a half turns. As you can see already, even at this range, that's seriously hopping. Right. At 285 FPS, shooting no problems. I'll turn the hop a bit on a bit more. So that's a little bit too far. Take, take the hop off slightly. So I think that's about as slow as we're going to get it. And that looks visually incredibly slow. So that is 189 FPS. I think we might be able to squeeze just a little bit more hop out of it. So this hot modification needs 0 0.3 or 0 0.32 gram BBs, and you need to put very small increments of hop on when you're using it. So I think that's just a little bit far. So I think we'll say 189 FPS is the lowest FPS we can get using the hop uh, on this rifle. So now that we're happy that the FPS variation on this rifle is good and that the FPS within the, is within the legal limits, uh, we can take the rifle next door, complete the assembly of the buffer tube mechanism and solder on a Dean's connector. To reassemble the rifle now, we want to tuck the wiring underneath of the stock plate and the castle nut. So the black wire is on the left. I want to keep it on the channel on the left. 
tuck it into the grooves and out the back. And with the right red wire, we want to do the same thing. Again, try and keep it inside of the grooves and in the corner here, you just want to tuck it in so that it sits flush. Lay the wiring down. Make sure that the right is to the right of this tab and the left, uh, the black is to the left. You can then put the ASAP stock plate into position. So again, hold the wiring in down into place, make sure it's not in the way. And when the ASAP plate is in the right spot and the stock tube is in exactly the right orientation, you'll find that the two will go together. A little bit of a fiddle, but I think we're there now. So then you can put the rifle upside down again. Make sure that the wiring hasn't been caught by the stock plate or the castle nut. Lift this little ring out of position. Take the castle nut and try and find the threading on the back of the receiver. From the Tokyo Marie factory, they lock tight this castle nut, however, it's not entirely necessary to do that. You can, if you're careful. Just do it up tight enough so it is not required. There we go. So you might get a bit of a sticky position at times. Just persevere with it. So if you do it up, if you look down the rifle and you centralize the buffer tube, you want to make sure that it's not offset because as you tighten it, it will try and go even more offset. There's a bit of a trick to this, and we'll show you that now. So in your left hand, grip the buffer tube and have the pistol grip just above your arm like this. What this does is prevent the rifle from spinning as you tighten the castle nut. Then you want to place your delta um, castle nut tool into um, the grooves and pull tightly to lock into place. And you'll see now that that receiver buffer tube are centralized. After you have tightened the castle nut, you want to put this uh, wire cover back into place under the castle nut. It's one way around, one way it won't work. So it's the way where these protrusions line up with the gap crossways in the buffer tube there. So we'll slide it under on the front, make sure none of the wires are catching, push it into place and it should sit nice and flush. We then need to take the stock position plate. Again, making sure the wires are either side and nothing's caught. Put the stock position plate into space like this. You'll see it's perfect, perfect fit for the grooves that are already in the buffer tube. And then again, I'll show you the knack for doing up these screws. So we've turned the rifle upside down. We're gonna get some blue lock tight. Just put a small amount into each hole. And then we're going to take our screws, the screwdriver we use to remove them. And we're going to push up again as before, push up into the screw and push down at the same time. Not too tight, but so you have to feel the pinch. And the same on the rear screw. Make sure it doesn't wobble. And now we can go and solder on our Dean's connector, leaving just a two inch tail.
So now we just need to put the stock on. This customer's chosen to uh, purchase one of our DCA CTR style stocks, um, which has had the extended butt pad milled. Um, that is done by LCS Engineering Outpost, and you can find him on Facebook or Instagram. So if you have a look here, you can put the stock on to the tube. Make sure the wiring doesn't get caught either side. And then once you're in this position, sometimes you can do it by hand. Usually it requires a flathead screwdriver. So you just want to pull out on this tab, slide the stock in, the wiring will come out the end. And it should stick into position nicely. And you've got that extra tab if you want to lock the stock as well. So we've put one of our 7.4 1100MAH LiPos uh, from New Prol into the modified butt pad. And we're just going to plug that into the rifle now. The stock must be at least one position out to work effectively, um, which gives you enough room for the, the wiring. So I'm just going to tuck that wiring up nicely. Push the stock into place. And then you will need to put the screw into the bottom of the CTR stock. It's just a pull out using an Allen key. And then once that's in, all we're going to do is get this Velcro section that comes with the CTR stock and use it to tighten up the buffer pad so it doesn't come loose. Um, there you have it. One completed tier three plus MOSFET Tokyo Marie Delta Custom.